Hello, and thank you very much for asking me to speak at your conference. Apologies, I can't be with you in person. I uh, hope to get out to you one day, but hopefully um, my presentation today, being recorded here in sunny Newcastle upon Tyne, uh, will do as some sort of substitute for you. When I was a child, my father used to enjoy teasing me with odd sayings, verbal puns and such like. How high is a Chinaman, being one that I recall having me perplexed for many a year. Another I re remember being repeatedly trotted out is, the king is dead, long live the king. It wasn't, of course, a pun in the same vein as the previous, but there's always something about it, the apparent illogicality of the statement, I suppose, that used to tickle me as a small boy. Still does truth be known. According to Wikipedia, so obviously it must be true, according to Wikipedia, the term was first used in France in 1422, upon succession to the throne of Charles VII upon the death of his father, and has since become commonplace in many European countries, my own included, to mark the death of one monarch and the accession of an heir. Indeed, as a boy, I remember being rather annoyed with our present monarch for having the bad form to be a woman with a male heir, thereby robbing me at some future point of hearing this proclamation made in earnest. The Queen is dead, long live the King, just didn't have the same linguistic appeal. On one level, the phrase is an obvious and logical statement of fact, that one monarch has died, but their heir is still alive and will hopefully remain so for a very long time. But go beyond this, and it's clearly intended to embody a concept rather more profound than this. It speaks of the separation between he or she who wears the crown and the concept of the crown itself. The distinction between the actor, who may embody the part at any one time, but who is ultimately a transient presence, and the role of kingship and monarchy itself, which is deemed to be constant and permanent and to continue without interruption. Put simply, the message is kings may come and kings may go, but the monarchy is here to stay. An important message indeed in times past when the death of a king could well usher in instability, challenge and even revolution. Without this powerful message it is still very much business as usual. One of the closest parallels of this separation between the person and the role in popular culture can be found in the guise of Doctor Who. What started as a nifty means of continuing a popular series following the declining health of its leading actor has since become one of the central tenets of the series' folklore that the Doctor can take on many different human forms which in themselves can be killed off, but which rather than lead into the permanent demise of the Doctor, simply lead to his regeneration in another human form. The Doctor is dead, long live the Doctor, so to speak. What, I'm sure you're all wondering, does this have to do with archives and records management? Well, what I hope to argue today is that there's never been a time when the concepts and theories which underpin archives and records management have been more relevant or more necessary than they are today and look set to be in the future. And yet it may also be the time for us, archivists and records managers, to face the fact, uncomfortable as it may be, that we may not be best placed to deliver that message. That it is possible, maybe even desirable, to separate we the actors from the roles we currently play and that being prepared to do so may well be the best service that we can ever give. A case perhaps of the records manager is dead, long live records management. Let us start with the good news. Archival and record theory is in demand. But before I go on to explain why and how, I'd like to propose that for the rest of this talk that I use the term record theory as a catch-all statement for both archival and records management theory. And likewise, records professionals, record keeping practice, etc. to embrace both the archival and the current records management arms of our profession. This is chiefly because it's less of a mouthful to uh, say and hear, but also, as we shall see, because the distinction between the two is largely irrelevant even possibly unhelpful in the context of what I'm going to say. So to return to my point, records theory is, or at least should be, in demand and like never before. The should be is an important qualification, as I strongly suspect that it's a medicine to an ailment society has not yet realised it's suffering from. For some time now we've known that our ability to create and store information outstrips our ability to manage it. But this appears to be the elephant in the room that has been not yet been noticed or accepted. Also, that this is uh, true of people's private lives as well as in the workplace. It matters not whether we're talking about emails in the office, photos on our cameras, programs on our Sky Plus box. Our information repositories are bulging at the seams. Nature, it's said, abhors a vacuum, and this is certainly true when it comes to digital storage devices. It doesn't seem to matter how many gigabytes they provide, we feel duty-bound to fill them. The perceived answer in recent years has, of course, been to improve ways of finding stuff. Back in 2006, I came across a quote in Information World Review which seemed to encapsulate this view perfectly. 
Information, it said, is inherently disorganised and not uniformly stored, and it's better to provide good search than to provide good organisation of the information. Now, those still awake may have noticed that the emphasis here is on information, not records. A point of clarification which also applies to varying degrees to my previous examples of emails, photos and TV programmes. It's certainly a distinction as traditionally exercised we records professionals, trained as we are to believe in the importance of the record over mere information, and of developing tools and approaches designed to manage the former, whilst largely ignoring the latter. But is this still a useful distinction, or one which has meaning to people other than ourselves? It's certainly questionable whether our users make such distinctions. Few, if any, pause to consider if the email they're about to write fulfills the requirements of a record or counts as mere information. Ditto the tweets, IM messages and photos. To them it's just stuff. Some of it more important than others, sure. Some is destined to be accessed more frequently than others. But ultimately it is still just stuff. Stuff they have to create, stuff they have received, stuff they need to deal with, stuff they are drowning in. The same is true for the IT manager. It would be a little comfort to them to be told that only 10% of the information they hold on their servers are records, unless we can magically make the remaining 90% straining their servers unnecessarily uh, disappear without fear or hindrance to the organisation. The law too has moved in this direction. We have, of course, here in the UK, a Freedom of Information Act, not, you'll note, a Freedom of Records Act. It matters uh, not a difference to the requester or the commissioner whether the salient facts come in the form of a ready-made record or are written on the back of a dozen fag packets, beer mats or post-it notes. They're all subject to the same laws, equally likely all of them to contain the infamous smoking gun, especially I suppose the fag packet, and therefore are all desirous of management in some shape or form. At the moment most of the debate regarding the challenges posed by this data deluge is framed by questions of access how we navigate such vast volumes of information, how we locate the precise information object we are after, how we make sense of the totality of our information stores and how we break free of the storage silos and liberate the data itself. This is all uncharted territory um, and the ramifications of failure are immediately apparent, both to the frustrated individual unable to find the email they need or the organisation unable to protect its interests as part of a legal discovery exercise. In such circumstances, it's little wonder that some commentators believe that providing good search is indeed better than providing good organisation of the information. But other problems lie ahead, problems that we are largely shielded from at the moment, but which common sense and logic dictates we can't keep on avoiding. Put simply, we can't keep everything forever, and this is not a problem that good search alone can ever solve. Storage may seem free and infinite to the average user, but as with everything, it comes with a cost. There are only so many dams in the world for Google to utilise to power and cool their servers. And according to a recent report from Greenpeace, if the cloud were a country, its electricity demand would currently rank fifth in the world. That alone should be enough to dispel the myth that digital storage can ever come without a price. So at some point, the ethical paradox must surely strike home of living in a culture where we are increasingly required to quote that great sage of our times, Bob the Builder, to reduce, reuse and recycle, and to consider the impact on the environment of every facet of our material lives, whilst the permanent storage of every junk email, cranky YouTube video and novelty app apparently goes unquestioned. Nor would it be wise to assume that storage would always remain free to the end user. Sure, the current prevailing business models of Google, Yahoo and the like are to provide free storage, but it need not always be so. Imagine the anguish in five years' time if Google were to suddenly start charging for content stored over a certain threshold. All of a sudden, that hitherto hidden part of the equation, the concept of relative value, comes shooting to the surface. And the question, what do I have that's worth me retaining, suddenly becomes the most important one, and one which great searchability alone will not help you to answer. Appraisal, managed retention and disposal concepts that are all commonplace to us, but largely alien not only to general users, but to most of the IT industry also. At the moment, ours is a message that no one wants to hear. It's akin to being the uh, automotive engineer trying to persuade the board of an American car company in the 1960s they really should be looking to develop frugal, fuel-efficient engines. This is a message that nobody wants to hear because they're living in the good times and nobody likes a party pooper. But this continued, now increased, need to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff is likely to be driven by other factors too. Here in the UK, as in the rest of Europe, we will continue to be subject to the Data Protection Act. 
um, which means that at an organisational level at least, there will remain a significant subset of the information we hold, personal data, for which managed retention and disposal must remain the norm, regardless of our technical abilities to store it all. I also wonder whether we reach a tipping point whereby even a generation born to expect information at their fingertips will start to reach the limitations of what is within their ability to process as human beings. Good search will undoubtedly help in this regard, but without combining this with some notion of what is of value, and there's that word again, of value to the individual and the function they're trying to perform, it's unlikely to represent a complete answer. Precisely when people wake up to the problems they face, it's impossible to predict and will largely uh, depend on the decisions made by these big storage and service providers on if and when and how they start to charge. All the while storage remains free, I suspect people will struggle on. Their organisations may come to their senses sooner, based in part on their increased exposure to legal risk. And of course we should acknowledge that not all cloud services offer free storage at present. One of the great selling points of the cloud in terms of storage um, is the, the flexibility of storage provision that it requires. Running out of space, need a few terabytes more? Sure, no problem. We'll up your tariff and away you go. Only need a bit of server capacity for a week or two to see you over that spike in activity? Yeah, we can sort that. This is indeed a great benefit and far more efficient than having to predict storage requirements before buying hardware and then either realising you've paid too much for storage you don't need or more likely too little for space that is all too soon gone. But interestingly, one of the unintended consequences of this change is likely to be the increased visibility of storage costs. Rather than being subsumed within the other cost of purchasing a big electronic black box, it will be there in black and white in your monthly statement. How many giga, or tera or petabytes you're using and how much it's costing you. No longer will it be a hidden cost, but one very much in the face of the head of IT, the finance director and the chief executive. But if the when is difficult to predict, the what it is that users and organisations are going to need to combat this problem is, I believe, a little easier to define. Value is a concept that has crept up several times already. As records professionals, we know not all information is of equal value, and when users have to really start paying for their storage, so they will too. But knowing you don't want to pay unnecessarily to store stuff you don't need is one thing. Being able to make informed decisions as to what information is worth keeping is another thing entirely. And even if you don't buy the premise that information storage may soon have a penalising cost element, there are other facets to the value proposition worthy of consideration. We often talk, as I did earlier, about a world with information at our fingertips. The reality, of course, is a little different. It is true that we do now have the potential to keep vast amounts of data constantly near to hand, but not everything, not at least without severely limiting its speed and ease of access. And this is why organisations implement email archives, for example, to hive off older emails. Keeping your current and useful material near to hand, whilst relegating the less useful to less immediate storage, is therefore nothing new, though the scale with which it's now required clearly raises new challenges. So we can expect our users, be they individual citizens or vast corporations, to not only need to know what to keep, but what to keep where, to make storage and access as efficient and cost effective as possible. And speaking of what to keep where, how often over the years have we tut-tutted at the user who insists on keeping all their emails in Outlook and fails to add them to the corporate record-keeping system? Oh, you should manage information according to its content, we say, not its format. You wouldn't keep all your Word documents in one folder, your Excel spreadsheets in another, would you? We say. And yet here we are, happily moving into a world where we allow all our videos to be stored by YouTube, our blog posts in Blogger, our tweets in Twitter, and our emails in Gmail. Now, I've spoken elsewhere about the ramifications of this for the researchers of tomorrow and, and the associated risks, so won't be doing so again here today. But it suffice to say that with content related by subject being stored in multiple unconnected format-specific silos, the user faces a significant challenge in being able to draw these disparate threads together, to reconstruct in the future how it all pieces together and to seamlessly navigate from one data source to another based on the sequence of events which created them in the first place. It'll be a little like trying to complete a jigsaw puzzle where someone has put all the straight pieces in one room, the corner pieces in another and the middle pieces in yet another and remove the picture from the box too. So much then for the challenges, what are the solutions? Well, let's recap. Users are likely to need objective and reliable ways of ascribing value to the information they hold and to use this knowledge to determine which of it should be retained and where and which can safely be removed. They need to find ways of linking information based not on its format, but on its content. 
of reconstructing the processes which created the information and of being able to demonstrate its origins. Mm. Let's see. Appraisal. Tick. Retention management. Tick. Management by content, original order and provenance. Tick, tick and tick. Well, I'll be damned. It's records management, Jim, but sadly not as we know it. Certainly on one level, these are all challenges which we are used to and we may well feel justified in thinking lies squarely within our professional gambit. But we need to recognise we're dealing with a very different landscape to the one we're used to working in. In a world, it's a world which has technology at its core, running through the heart of every challenge like a name in a stick of rock. It is the game changer, the thing which creates the distance between the problems we face and our ability as a profession to resolve them. And unfortunately we're only kidding ourselves if we try to pretend this isn't so. I was once criticised at a conference portraying what I seem to recall was described as a depressingly technocentric view of the world, for suggesting that technology was the biggest single factor shaping the direction of information creation and management. Really? Does anyone here really think that technology isn't in the driving seat when it comes to determining how information is created nowadays? What is it that allows us to create vast volumes of data that would be unimaginable just a decade ago, enables us to create and store information and access it anywhere just using a web browser? which allows millions of users to share, merge, reuse, communicate, rate uh, content seamlessly and instantly, and to communicate it with each other or broadcast to the world in a dozen different ways. Bill Clinton famously had a slogan pinned above his desk during the 1992 election campaign, lest anyone forgot, it's the economy, stupid. Well, folks, as if you needed reminding, it's technology, stupid. The question is, where does this leave us as records professionals? It's always dangerous to generalise, but from my own experience, I think it's fair to say that ours is not a profession with technology at its core. It's not a criticism, it's a fact, and a reflection of where we've come from. If I think back to my classmates at UCL in 1997, where I did my Masters in Archives and Records Management, I recall the vast majority, myself included, had history degrees, with maybe an English and perhaps a classic degree thrown in. But what I can say quite categorically is that not one of us had a background in IT. 15 years later, having checked, I believe the same is still true today at UCL and is replicated to varying degrees with other schools teaching archives and records management in the UK. Now I should state again, and for the avoidance of doubt, that this is not intended as a criticism. It is a statement of fact and a reflection of our professional origins. It's also a background, training and ethos which stands the vast majority of us in very good stead for our current roles. We know our records, we know the times in which they were created, and we understand the people and processes that created them. We instinctively take the long view, and that is to our credit and to the benefit of the collections in our care. I would no more ask a programmer straight from Google HQ to look after our existing archival collections than I would ask you to create a new search algorithm to improve Google Android's uh, interface. We are each expert in our respective field, and each equally worthy of the recognition, respect and reward that should go with it. The management of existing archival records unquestionably belongs in the hands of the archival profession and it's right that it does so. You'll note the deliberation with which I have twice now alluded to our existing archival collections. But of course, our archives are rarely static. Most continue to grow, to acquire new records and to seek to manage the flow of records through the various stages of the continuum. And it's in this regard that we continue to fall further and further behind the curve. We still haven't got to grips with the management of email some 30 years or so after its invention, let alone begun to construct effective strategies and solutions for dealing with social media and other non-traditional forms of electronic record. All too often the default position is, understandably, to try to prevent usage or to influence it through policy rather than active intervention. Similar tactics to those employed by King Canute with, I fear, similar results. And year by year, so the gulf widens between the forces of information creation and the tools at our disposal to manage it. The best way to stop a juggernaut is, they often say, uh, to get behind the wheel. But herein lies the crux of our problem. Even if we did manage to force open the cab door, clamber into the driver's seat, would we actually know what to do next? Would we have the skills and experience to read the instruments, work the gears and get the machine under our control and going where we want it to go? I'm not sure we do. By and large, we are users of IT, not developers, consumers, not creators. At best, we're system administrators, but we're not coders, systems designers, or app developers, and nor, I suspect, do many of us want to be. 
The uncomfortable truth might just be, however, that these are precisely the skills which are required to solve the challenges that we face. As we've all been saying since Beermen in the 1990s, we need IT systems with records management and archival functionality built in. But now it goes far beyond that. It's not just about organisations and the systems they procure anymore, but about millions of individual users and the platforms, products and apps that they use on a daily basis. This is a challenge on an epic scale, and it's one that has technology, not history, at its core. As we have seen, records theory has a great deal to offer, but we face a challenge that I strongly suspect is beyond we records professionals to conquer. So where does this leave us? We could, of course, keep clinging to the notion that only we get it, that it's up to we records professionals to keep sweeping up after the mess created by an IT industry that most certainly does not get it. We can keep plugging away, trying to put the brakes on the uptake of new technology, trying to influence actions through policies and wringing our hands about how far short we are falling. What I might describe as the business as usual option. Or worse still, we can try and achieve the contortionist trick of simultaneously putting our fingers in our ears and our head in the sand and deny culpability of all these issues um, that we have in theory at least part of the solution for. Or maybe, just maybe, there is a third way. And that is that we continue to provide the same levels of excellence in the care of our existing archives as we have always done, but that we acknowledge that when it comes to defining the management strategies and the solutions and the products for dealing with new content, both now and into the future, that the records manager, the king in our particular story, is indeed dead, and that it's time for someone else, someone better suited in the guise of the IT professional, to take up the crown. In doing so, we should not view this as an abdication, an abandonment of some divine right, but as a natural process of succession done in the best interest of the body politic, the coronation of a rightful and worthy heir. But this does not for a minute imply that our work is done, simply that we best served if we channel it in a new direction. Perhaps if we were to extend this monarchical comparison a little further, we could view the years ahead as a period of minority rule, with our role as that of the protector. Firstly, we need to convince the relevant sections of the IT industry, and even more importantly, those wishing to enter it, that this is a role they could and should take on. They need to be aware of the challenges and to appreciate that progress in technology must be balanced with responsibility for the information it creates, and that equal effort must be devoted to designing information and curatorial tools, as is currently devoted to tools which allow us to create and manipulate information. They need to absorb our perspective as information custodians, appreciate what it is that we have sought to achieve and can be convinced that it's worth their while to achieve it. In short, we must help create, guide and train the next generation of records professionals and pass on our knowledge to them in the hope that by doing so and by combining their ex IT expertise with a new found appreciation of records theory that they are fully prepared to wear the crown proper. Is this defeatist? Some may well think so. Does it limit our professional horizons? Probably. Is an admission of professional failure? Possibly. But it's also realistic. It allows us to play to our strengths and to take pride in what we do well, not to dwell on our shortcomings. Is it a cop-out? No. Far from it. We still have the vital job to do of convincing and training IT professionals to take on the role. Plus to think so would be to undervalue the necessity of the role of the records professional working with records stored in traditional media. Is it the right thing to do? I believe so. It's hard to see how records professionals can ever be anything more than tinkerers with technology. Now is the time to hand over to the professionals. Think of us as the first aiders, if you like. We were first on the scene. We've managed to stem the bleeding and to massage the heart, but now professional help is at hand. The paramedics are here, so too the cardiac surgeons and the trauma nurses. So what should we do? Wave them away and keep on going, or give them the patient's history, hand them over to their care and breathe a relieved and well-deserved sigh of relief. Moreover, and more importantly, which would you prefer if you were the patient? And once handed over, we can breathe a little more easily again, safe in the knowledge that we have done our duty and can return to our professional roots to focus once again on what we are best at. After all, we still have over 900 years of records to keep safe here in the UK. 900 years? Now, you've got to admit it, that's not a bad reign for any king. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully, if I've set my alarm clock right, uh, I should be online uh, in a few minutes to take any questions or comments that you might have. So I look forward to speaking to you soon. Thanks.